Hi, everybody, and welcome to session one of Parenting, Getting It Right. As we get started, we thought it would be helpful for you to know just a bit about our family. That's so, right. We've been married 34 years, and we have three kids. Whose stories we will exploit throughout our time together. With their permission. We did get their permission, right? For the most part. Anyway, we have three adult children, Andrew, Garrett, and Allie, and they're all 20 months apart. Because we're planners. Nope, because they're 20 months apart. <laughs> Andrew, our oldest, is a stand-up comedian. Garrett, our middle, is our extrovert and works with a wonderful marketing firm here in the Atlanta area. And Allie, our youngest, actually works with me at North Point Community Church. Allie and Garrett are married, and by the time this series is released, Andrew will be too, and we love, love, love our daughters-in-law and our son-in-law. We do, but maybe the most exciting news of all is we are expecting our first grandchild in about five months, so uh, that's, that's us. Right. That's right. Well, I'm gonna hand this session off to Andy in just a minute, but before I slip out, one of the reasons we decided to write Parenting and create this series is that when Andrew, our oldest, was born, we immediately began leaning into the wisdom of parents who we thought got it right or were getting it right. And the funny thing was none of them claimed to be experts, but they told us what they did and they shared the things they were learning along the way. Yeah, so that's really our goal in this series. We're not here to fill your parenting cup. Our goal is simply to empty ours. That's right. So I'm gonna let Andy take it from here and I will see you again in session two. So about 30 years ago, a young woman whose name, honestly, I don't remember, who I had only known for a couple of hours said something I'll never forget. I'll never forget it because it scared me to death. She said, and I quote, Mr. Stanley, Mr. Stanley, if you'll pull your car around to the front entrance of the hospital, I'll bring Mrs. Stanley and baby Andrew down to meet you. To which I thought, why so soon? I mean, other than the food, everything was so perfect there. And why should we take baby Andrew home? Nobody at our house knows anything about taking care of a baby. Surely they were not going to allow us to take a baby home all by ourselves but they did. They always do. And as we drove away, the nurse <laughs> waved goodbye with that knowing look in her eye that said, you have no idea. And she was correct. But we figured it out. So did you. By figured it out, I mean we figured out how to feed, clothe, change, burp, and get a baby to sleep through the night. But even with all that going on, there was always this disquieting question. And the question was, are we doing this right? Are we doing it right? Now, I, I don't have to tell you that that initial concern never goes completely away. Um, it's why you've carved out time for this study. Um, you're pretty sure you're doing it right, but when it comes to our kids, pretty sure isn't enough. We wanna be sure, sure, right? Then, just when we feel like we might be doing it right, the seasons change. They outgrow their shoes, they outgrow their beds, and eventually we wonder, or you will wonder, if maybe they're outgrowing us. Eventually, hormones and testosterone flip the script, and the question that hovered in the background for the first maybe 11 or 12 years is suddenly front and center. We no longer have the luxury of wondering if we're doing it right. There are daily reminders that more than likely we're not doing it right, and then eventually our kids assure us that we're wrong because their best friend's parents are doing it right. So, are you getting this right? It's it's a terrifying question. It's terrifying because while we all come equipped with a rear view mirror, we don't come equipped with a reverse. Our mistakes are a permanent part of our parenting story. Worse, our mistakes are a permanent part of our children's childhood. So while I'm sure at some level you've wondered if you're doing it right, in this study, we're gonna challenge you to ask a more fundamental question. The question that we're gonna talk about is this question. What is it? What exactly is the it you want to get right? What is the it you so desperately don't want to get wrong? Now, most parents are so busy parenting, they never stop to consider what they're parenting to, um, what they're parenting for. They're too busy to stop and consider the end game, the goal, the prize, the win. And I'm not being critical. Um, we get it. We had three in diapers for a minute. Not our finest parenting moment, I'll admit. But anyway, what is, what is the it? What's the win for you as a parent? You have one, by the way, um, a win that is. In two parent homes, it's not uncommon for parents to have two different wins in mind. And when that's the case, parents parent at cross purposes. The result is a tension that neither parent can explain, but one that children sense and teenagers learn to exploit. So again, 
What is your win? Is it safety or obedience or graduation? Um, make you proud, NFL, Broadway. Uh, maybe for your kids to have the things that you never had to go further educationally than you did. Um, I coached enough baseball to know that for some parents, the win is for their kids to excel where they hoped to but didn't. And again, none of those are bad or wrong, but when culled out and examined closely, honestly, none of those are enough. And that's the problem. So allow me to be direct. If you don't hit pause, if you don't hit pause long enough to consider the direction in which you're parenting, you may wake up one day to realize you parented in the wrong direction. And by wrong, I mean you parented in a direction you would not have chosen if you had stopped long enough to choose. It happens all the time. I mean, it's the principle of the path. The principle of the path says this, that direction determines destination, that direction, not intention, determines a person's destination. So you are parenting in a direction and the direction you choose consciously or unconsciously will in some ways determine your parenting destination, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, as well as academically and professionally. Now, Sandra and I are foster parents, and we have seen this played out in the most heartbreaking ways imaginable. So it's super important to us, and it's super important to us that you understand this. You are currently parenting in a direction. You owe it to your child or your children to choose it ahead of time. Now, if you're not convinced, just consider this. If you don't define and choose your it, it will be chosen for you. If your parenting style, habits, responses, um, approach to discipline are not dictated by a predetermined win, they will be dictated by circumstances, culture, uh, the reaction of your children and the expectations of others, including your parents. Parenting becomes a whirlwind. And in the whirlwind, parenting is reduced to reacting, reacting to the moment rather than leading your kids and your family in a predetermined direction toward a desired destination. And I know, This sounds so complicated because parenting is complicated, but you wanna get it right. And to get it right, you need to identify your it. And that's what this study is all about, sort of. Actually, Sandra and I would like to suggest an it. The it we're convinced makes all the difference. It's not original with us. As Sandra mentioned up front, we borrowed most of our parenting skills from veteran parents that we observed and did life with through the years. Parents who we feel like got it right. And in that regard, we feel like we may have two advantages. First of all, um, Sandra and I spent over 10 years working with middle school and high school students at a local church. We were privy to a behind the curtain look at a variety of family systems and a broad range of parenting styles. Honestly, I think we saw them all. We saw permissive, legalistic, um, fear-based, helicopter, too involved, not involved enough. Um, uh, We watched parents bail their kids out of situations the kids got themselves into. And then we saw some parents shrug as if to say, hey, good luck with that, right? Many of the students who we were involved with during our student ministry days are actually still involved with one of our local churches. They're married with kids of their own, and some of them are even grandparents. That's three generations we've had the privilege to watch, evaluate, and learn from. Now, the second advantage we had was Sandra's family, her parents in particular. They got it right. What I observed and experienced with the Walker family confirmed what we'd observed and the parents that we'd admired most during our student ministry days. And what got my attention about Sandra's family was that they genuinely enjoyed and looked forward to being together. Sandra's brother, Jack, lived in California for several years while Sandra's family was back in Georgia. And when her family gathered without Jack, they always called him to tease him about what he was missing out on, home cooking, grandmama's cookies. But what was just another day in the neighborhood for the Walker clan? Honestly, it was new and unusual and very attractive to me. Their family was pretty much drama-free and tension-free. It was relaxed and enjoyable. So when Andrew, our oldest, was born, um, I had an end in mind. I wanted us to end up where the Walker family had ended up. Now for Sandra, it was all she knew, but I knew that families don't drift in that direction. They don't drift in the direction of what her family experienced. They actually drift in the other direction. So on our way to the beach to spend a week with Sandra's family with baby Andrew strapped into his car seat, I suggested we set some family goals, honestly, because I needed a plan. So we set four goals. 
Um, only one of those goals actually survived the rigors of parenthood, but it turns out it was the most important one and the one most closely associated with the dynamic I'd observed in the Walker family. And it's been our North Star ever since. Um, it informed every aspect of our parenting, the words we chose, the tone we set, our schedule, and even the way we disciplined our kids. It was our it, and we highly recommend it. So here it is, our it, the it we will advocate for throughout our time together. Here's what we wrote down. Kids who enjoy being with us and with each other when they no longer have to be. This was our North Star. Kids who would enjoy being with us and with each other when they no longer have to be. That's it. That was our, that was our goal and it was 100% relational. So we parented, and this is important, we parented with the relationship in mind, their relationship with us and their relationship with each other, their current and future relationships. If it was good for the relationship, it was good. If it wasn't good for the relationship and our family, it became a thou shalt not. Now, Raising kids who enjoy being with you and with each other once they're grown and gone <laughs> may not seem very groundbreaking or sound groundbreaking and certainly not a groundbreaking concept. Um, and it may not be what you value most right now. And I understand that, especially in the early years. I mean, during the early years, who stops to consider what it's gonna be like when they're grown and gone? Well, parents who are parenting with grown and gone in mind. That's who considers that. Parents who are parenting with the future relationships in mind, which is precisely why determining your it early is so important. But honestly, honestly, if I had not seen it, I would not have set my sights on it. And I may have missed parenting toward it. Left to my own, just the way I'm wired, um, I would not have parented with a relationship in mind. I would have parented with compliance and competence and accomplishment in mind. And don't get me wrong, I'm still a fan of competence and accomplishment, but I'm so grateful I did not embrace either or both of those as the win for our family, the it. Now, the younger your child or your children are, the less urgent this is going to feel. Um, you'll tell yourself, well, perhaps this can wait, but actually the opposite is true. Your relationship with your children, this is so important, your relationship with your children is determined by the law of the harvest, not the last minute urgency that we sometimes associate with a final exam. You can procrastinate and cram for an exam and still do okay, but farmers don't have that luxury, do they? You can't cram for a crop. You plan for a crop. The farmer who procrastinates, well, farmers don't procrastinate. I mean, heck, they have their own almanac, right? So as Sandra will explain the session to, there are four primary sowing seasons for parents. Procrastinate and miss the first one, and you will be playing catch up forever after. And you've seen what happens when parents approach parenting like a final exam. The kids are constantly in and out of timeout. And during adolescence, sometimes they're in and out of other things as well. Again, you can cram for a test. You can't cram for a crop. You sow, you water, you fertilize, you protect, and then you wait. And you wait and you wait. We remind parents all the time, don't grade your parenting until your crop is in. And the good news is the crop isn't in at 13 or even 18. It comes in somewhere around, I don't know, 23, because even perfect parents are no match for a lack of frontal lobe development. So we wait. Now, you may be thinking, and, and I understand this, you may be thinking, Andy, this sounds like a recipe for codependency, okay? Everybody's gonna get along forever and ever and be together forever and ever. This sounds like codependency. It is not a recipe for codependency. In fact, I'm sure as you've noticed, codependent people don't really enjoy each other. They just can't survive without each other. Big difference. Independence, independence is essential for mutually satisfying relationships. Children who don't fully individuate are robbed of the opportunity to choose an adult relationship with their parents. Or to say it a different way, you can't choose to reconnect with something or someone you never disconnected from to begin with. So if you choose to parent with a relationship in mind, here's some good news. You will parent your children out of your house and off your payroll. You'll parent them toward independence. Like so many facets of parenting, this is counterintuitive, but it is oh so true. In fact, parents who refuse to let go or let go late undermine their relationship with their children. 
And in addition to concerns about this being a recipe for codependency, there's another concern that surfaces sometimes. Um, there is a legitimate concern that this approach is a bit self-serving. And I, I say legitimate because to be honest, this approach to parenting is self-serving, but it's self-serving all the way around. Everybody in the family is served. Everybody benefits. Everybody wins because parenting with a relationship in mind leads to better relationships. The point being, parenting with a relationship in mind equips our kids to be good at relationships, all types of relationships. And, and this is so important, relational health, along with the ability to form and maintain healthy relationships is a predictor of success and happiness. I mean, think about it. Nobody, nobody is happier than their relationships are satisfying. Parenting with a relationship in mind actually equips your children for relational success now and later. And as we'll talk about throughout our time together, later is longer. Odds are, think about it, odds are one day your kids will have kids and their relationship with their kids, your grandkids, will be impacted by the health of their relationship with you. So yes, this approach is definitely self-serving, but it serves everybody. Now, as we bring this first session to a close, I want to end by pointing out what is perhaps an obvious but often overlooked reality that will preside like a judge over every aspect of your relationship with your children. It determines what your children hear, regardless of what you actually say, and it regulates how you feel, regardless of what they actually meant. And I include it here because if you choose to parent with a relationship in mind, it is critical that you recognize and embrace this fundamental relational reality. So here it is. While you are in a relationship with your children, it is not the same relationship. Your children do not have the same relationship with you that you have with them. It's not even close. Just think about it. You are relating to a child. Your child is relating to an adult. You are in a relationship with someone who is completely dependent. Your child is in a relationship with someone who holds all the cards. Those are two very different relationships. Now, when our children are young, nobody needs to remind us of this, right? I mean, they can't do anything for us and we do everything for them. But once they begin walking and talking and disobeying and, you know, repeating things they picked up at the neighbor's house, it is so easy to lose sight of this reality. And, and we discussed this at length in the book, the moment a parent gives up his or her unique role or his or her unique seat in the relationship, communication becomes unnecessarily challenging and confusing for everybody. With, with each passing year and each additional inch, it will become increasingly difficult to keep this relational reality front and center, but you have to do so because the implications of this dynamic are endless. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, example number one, you should always choose your words with your role in mind rather than their size, their age, or their reaction in mind. They, they may look different than they did 10 years ago, but the relationship isn't different. Um, as you're quick to remind them when you feel like the reins are slowly slipping out of your hands, right? I'm still your mother, I'm still your father. Translated, just because you're as tall as me doesn't make you equal to me. Um, a second implication of this dynamic is this, and this is gonna shock you, Never argue with your children. Never argue with your children. Arguing is for peers. Arguing is for equals. And you are neither. You are their parent. The moment, the moment you step into the ring to argue with one of your children, you've already lost. You've lost because you've allowed your child to bait you away from your unique role. It is impossible. It is impossible to argue with your child as a parent. This is why you feel so defeated and exhausted when it's over, even if you prevail. Because you see, you weren't meant to prevail in your role as mom or dad. Prevailing is what you do at work or CrossFit or at school, but not at home. At some point along the way, and you know this, at some point along the way, your kids are gonna attempt to seize control sometimes overtly, sometimes covertly. I mean, it's what kids do, it's, it's what you did, it's what I did. But when that tension begins to characterize your relationship with one of your children, remember this, they don't really want control. They're attempting a coup they secretly hope fails. And your refusal to change your mind in the face of their tirades will eventually be appreciated, applauded, and perhaps emulated later. But for that to happen, you must remain seated in your assigned seat, the one labeled 
parent. You are in a relationship with your children, but it is not the same relationship. They will advocate for equity and equality. You must advocate for your unique role in their lives. If your North Star is a mutually satisfying relationship with adult children, don't abdicate your role along the way. Standing your ground will create tension. Choose to live with it. Don't attempt to eliminate it. Just as tension is required to build physical strength, the unavoidable, the unavoidable tension between parents and their children builds relational strength. And resolving it now will cost you later. So stay in your lane, keep your seat. After all, you've never heard a story. You've never heard a story that included, my parents were amazing. They pretty much gave me the reins when I was 13 and we remain close to this very day. So remain seated in the parent seat for the remainder of the flight. That will all but ensure that your children remain seated and feel secure in their seats as well. That's it for session one. In session two, Sandra's gonna walk you through the four stages of parenting, or as I referred to them earlier, the four stages of sowing so as to return a relational crop that is mutually satisfying and enjoyable. Don't miss session two, and I'll see you again in session three.